Lichenologist of Arizona. I also want to extend a warm welcome and want to apologize that I wasn't on the field trips. I um, meant to um, lead uh, one of them, but um, as I already had booked my uh, trip to Germany previously, I couldn't uh, really do this. So fortunately, um, last re rescue firefighter jumped in, uh, a student that I have, uh, Christian, and um, also Steve Levitt took you to Madeira Canyon. So really appreciated uh, that uh, effort, and I hope you enjoyed it all. Anyway, um, since I'm back in Arizona, I've been bugged by um, Tom Nash uh, of uh, taking this over, the North American uh, Lichen Portal, basically. And um, I've worked quite a bit on it, but um, I'm pretty sure most of you haven't quite noticed, uh, um, because much of it is in the background. And so I want to give you a brief update of what we've been doing, or what I, um, and especially Ed, have been doing re uh, done recently. Um, and so I'll... Um, First, uh, quickly mention the Neon uh, Bio Repository, which is being built up at uh, Arizona State University recently. And it's a very new, um, big, huge grant for many years, for the next 30 years, but that we got in, at Arizona State, and it will have some impact on the Lichen portal as well. Um, I also want to emphasize that this is not, not just a, a face list of, of, of the Lichen portal, but we've been doing a lot in, um, in the background, basically. Uh, for example, we've been establishing a new um, clone of the Lichen portal for Latin America, and we are going to be talking about, about this a bit. And then there's new options to um, use and utilize the checklists, which I think are pretty exciting. There's updates on the taxon profiles, and um, there's also some somewhat still experimental tools that uh, we are now able to offer and will be offering in the future. Um, and I will be talking uh, briefly also about new options to get help and support resources so, so that people don't have to bug me all that much um, about how the Lichen portal actually works. So um, the Neon Bio Repository is pretty exciting because you might know that um, there's this, um, it, it, I think it stands for a North American Ecological Observatory Network, um, uh, which is um, basically uh, permanent plots that are going to be monitored for the next uh, at least 30 years all across uh, different states of the US, including Puerto Rico and Hawaii. And, and so all these permanent samples that they're, they're um, um, collecting there um, will be deposited at, at ASU. Um, they're not collecting lichens, unfortunately, uh, which is um, maybe that's going to change at some point. But anyways, um, what this has to do with um, the consortium is that they were able to, um, we, we, we we're having a, new, a lot of new positions, including one uh, permanent position for Ed. And uh, that means that he has uh, now um, a lot less economic worries, and that means also that we um, can back him more, although he has less time. And uh, well, we'll see how that goes. Um, oh, yes, and there's actually going to be a lightning talk from Kelsey Julia uh, about this. So, Ed has been building the, this portal based on the Symbiota platform, which is a software that drives the lightning portal as well. And that's um, quite a benefit there as well. So, some synergies will come out of this. Um, Anyway, it's not just a facelift. We have a new interface uh, that was launched in February uh, of this year. Um, we have a new header. Um, the, men the menu has uh, easier navigation, I guess, than it previously was. And we have reorganized the checklist and inventories so that it it's easier to find things. And um, we now have bilingual support, uh, Spanish and English, um, which is exciting. But um, just to give you a brief um, a little bit of background on the Lichen portal, um, it was founded in 2011, by, sponsored by an NSF grant at the time, um, by, uh, which was awarded to Colonel Reese and Thomas Nash. And so now, um, after all these many years, um, which the Lichen portal almost looked uh, virtually the same, um, we have at least 100 plus different Lichen barrier across North America participating, which means that we have about uh, 2.3 million occurrence records in the portal, which uh, translates to specimens mostly because um, there's no uh, observational data or not very many, um, then these are mostly um, live data sets, which is actually really interesting. So um, they're updated whenever anybody changes anything in the portal, but we still have a lot of snapshot collections where people have stand on a lot of databases they enter and modify the data there, and they have to be updated regularly to be up to date in the portal, which can be a problem sometimes. Um, we have more than uh, almost a million uh, by now images uh, counting upwards, um, 
And many of those are linked to specimens, which is excellent because they kind of migrate along with the taxonomy when the taxonomy changes. And uh, we have uh, more than 280 um, checklists and inventory uh, projects uh, with different, um, from different regions all across uh, North America, basically, um, maintained in different ways, uh, depending on how active people are who take ownership of these. Um, yeah, and then, uh, so what Canon does, what the consortium basically does, is it manages uh, uh, specimen records, so current records, and that uh, part of uh, uh, the, the whole um, portal is uh, entirely Darwin Core compliant, which means that you can um, actually export this in the Darwin Core format and you can actually um, migrate the, the, that data also to, to other repositories like GBIF. Um, there's a checklist which are really interested uh, and interesting because they can be voucher based, they can be based on verified records, individual specimens that have been verified. And um, um, there's also a big thing in the background which people rarely notice, which is the taxonomic Theosaurus, which essentially is linked to the taxon profiles and which um, kind of keeps up with taxonomic changes. And maintaining this taxonomic uh, Theosaurus. It's a huge, huge headache, and I've spent a lot of um, working hours on and improving it, and it's still not perfect at all. Um, and so if anybody wants to help, um, we can talk about that as well. <laughs> anyway, um, specimen data is um, essentially what many people don't realize is that uh, the consortium is a full-fledged specimen management system, so you don't actually need to have a separate database. You can manage it, everything online inside the consortium if you like. It's maybe not as convenient and as intuitive as many other uh, options that are out there, but um, the big advantage is that the, you can do everything that a um, specimen management system does, and it's always live and up to date, and you could change the record from here in the auditorium uh, once you're connected to the internet. Huh? Then uh, it has uh, user permission control, um, and there's a lot of data management and cleaning tools, backup tools and statistical tools, which many people are not aware of. Um, and um, what's new and has been recently uh, implemented is that you can actually publish your data directly to, to GBIF. And that means you finally have a tool to easily update current records in, in GBIF uh, and thereby um, thus also improve the quality of the data. Um, where many people complain about um, the quality of the data in, in GBIF, and I agree, it's often really very poor. And um, so that's a, a fantastic tool, I think, which gives, um, gives you the opportunity to modify what's, what's available in GBIF. Um, so there's a lot of pitfalls and challenges when you deal with these huge, enormous biodiversity repositories. Um, basically, uh, there's a very easy saying, garbage in, garbage out, right? So if you put bad data in, you get bad data, data out. And um, we, we are all working with organisms that are really tricky. I mean, uh, Susan has just explained how messy it can be to try to identify even large showy, fancy uh, lichens and take them uh, apart, sort of a thing. So um, keeping that um, taxonomy up to date is another big challenge and the identification ac accuracy is, is a huge challenge. So essentially um, that's um, one thing that might be able to, uh, we might be able to address if we um, use more um, frequently and more interactively these checklists. I think checklist is, a, is an underappreciated tool that the, the, the consortium offers because it essentially allows you to base your inventories of a certain region on, um, on verified records, on voucher specimens that you saw, that you controlled, that you can verify. And I mean, most checklists that you find in journals these days is like, okay, so and so mentioned it in this literature from that side. And nobody actually checked that. And uh, rather than this approach, which you can also do, you can also cite literature, you can actually base your checklist on vouchers and on verified vouchers. And so you can review specimens. And you can only include verified records. And that will also eventually trickle down or trickle up to um, the various collections of current records. Um, you can um, add additional information to your checklist to make the checklist more powerful. And, um, you can uh, display these checklists in different views. So maybe you don't agree with the center of Theosaurus and you have your own kind of taxonomy that you want to follow, so you can display it in original and new and in center uh, Theosaurus, okay? All that stuff you probably already know, 
So the question now is what's new about the checklist? Mm. So just to give you an idea, um, this is a checklist I'm working on. It's the Little Nicholas and uh, 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 Lightning from Galapagos, Ecuador. And um, there's um, a lot of new ways how you can display the checklist. Um, you can sort it alphabetically by genus. Yeah, that wasn't previously implemented. Um, and you can display all the synonyms. So you can check the checklist button here to display the synonyms and then immediately see that there's other things that um, are synonyms of what you are according. And then you can change this between the original checklist or the way you enter the data and um, the way the taxonomic theosaurus in the background kind of treats these, these species, right? Um, then you have an option to add child checklists. And this is particularly interesting if you work, for example, on uh, something that has pre previously been reported from the Galapagos in this case, but no longer uh, is known to occur there because I did the review and I say, okay, well, whatever, somebody at, at some point uh, reported Acherospus citrina from the Galapagos, but I now know that that species actually is based on the misidentification of Acherospus chrysox, for example. Yeah? Um, and you can um, then and other child checklists, which automatically feed the information from the child to the parents. So, for example, we're working, or Christian's actually working right now on the red list of Galapagos endemic lichens. So, he is putting that together and it feeds um, that information upwards to the parent checklist. And you can now also have your checklist not just for state or region or whatever category you're in, but you can actually very finely delimit and outline um, the geographic polygon where your checklist applies to. So when you do a search for the vouchers that come from your region that, uh, that applies to your checklist, you can actually go and say, okay, in this polygon, give me everything that Calum has to offer, and then I can decide selectively which ones of those vouchers you want to add to the checklist and accept as confirmed records for that checklist, right? Then in the taxonomy there have been a couple of changes, so um, it's uh, possibly quite more powerful than we think. And here again is, is an example from Galapagos, the uh, uh, Cantolichen Galapagoensis. You already know the Sonoran flora tabs yeah, from it, but then you can add, add whatever description you like. Um, and for things that are even for places like the Galapagos, you can have several different tabs. You can have your images, of course. And our plan is that you automatically in the future will also have the microbiome number appearing here and hook this up as a resource to um, Index Fugorum. And, well, I'm already running out of time. I knew that before. <laughs> so <laughs> there's the, uh, the Robert Looking taxonomic th uh, stuff for um, uh, all the genera in there now. Um, you can um, have uh, erroneous records, uh, records and synonyms are, are separate. So one of the problems uh, that we previously often had is that Tom Nash um, and his team uh, occasionally imported the North American checklist into um, the consortium, and it was kind of it made a, it introduced a lot of errors because some of the synonyms weren't true synonyms, but erroneous reports from North America. So I've been cleaning up that that quite a bit. And um, yeah, I mentioned the Latin American consortium. So I'm running out of time. Um, I will be doing a workshop on this, um, um, and uh, we already have some collections from uh, Latin America in, in that consortium. Um, then um, there's some experimental tools and analytical tools that uh, will um, in the future be offered so to um, analyze uh, sociological information uh, based on herbarium records and GPS data. And just to give you an example from the Galapagos, this is what I've been doing with this. I've been looking at um, different plants occurring together and the likelihood within these plant communities. I'm really doing this quickly now. And I've uh, been using the data from the Galapagos also due to some um, habitat analysis according to the habitat information how I record it and doing PCR on this. So this is very experimental still. But it's all something that at, at some point in the future, or in the very near future, hopefully we, uh, we were able to offer. And at the very last thing of what I want to mention is what we very recently launched is the health and tutorial page where you can actually go and learn about how this all works. Um, and I'm constantly being ad adding uh, new stuff to this so that uh, we'll make it much easier to actually use um, the consortium site. 
Um, and one exciting thing that I thought uh, might be interesting, something that I put online recently, is you all might have used um, um, various ways how to figure out TLC plates, and one uh, very um, uh, um, popular tool used to be Wintabolites, and that doesn't run on 64-bit computers anymore. So we had a, a programmer that helps us with lots of programming uh, to do a 64-bit version of Ventabolites, which you can download now from this resource page, basically. And it's a pretty nifty tool. It um, has the newest data from Jack Elex incorporated in it already. Um, and you can use it to um, analyze your TLC plays and, uh, plays and play around with it. It's still in, in beta version, so if you find any bugs and something that doesn't work, let me know and we'll work and try to fix it. Okay, and um, now maybe I didn't need to run through it that quickly, but anyway, here's the acknowledgements, <laughs> and that's my talk. Thank you. Thank you.